Hello, my name is Clara Maveglia and I set up the Cultural Entrepreneurship Institute in Berlin. Today we are in Munich at the Ethics Competence Center of the Ludwig Maximilian University. Professor Fossenkul is one of the founders of the center and he will speak on the moral of traveling. Welcome. Der Tourismus ist weltweit gesehen die größte Einzelbranche. Tourism, in global terms, is the biggest individual sector of the economy, meaning that tourism earns the most money in the world. Hard to believe unless you've read it somewhere, but it's a fact. A sector we need to take seriously. But I don't want to talk about tourism as a sector, but about traveling. But of course, traveling is part of tourism and can hardly be isolated from tourism, but they're not quite the same. The boom in tourism has continued apace for decades now and it's still increasing, enduringly influenced of course over the last 15 or 20 years by a constant decline in airfares. You can fly all over the world now for money which you might spend on a taxi to cross the town you live in, depending on the size of your town of course. Cheap airfares are a temptation and more and more people decide at the last minute to pick up a rucksack and fly somewhere. Of course, parallel to that, parallel to these opportunities to fly anywhere in the world, cheap, with all these cheap companies, some of which go bankrupt from time to time, and others emerge. But parallel to that, there is rising criticism of mass tourism. Why? Well, quite simply, because mass tourism generates a whole load of damage, environmental damage. It is assumed that in the Bavarian or European Alps in general, 20% of environmental damage is caused by air traffic, 20%. Hard to believe, but if on a fine day you go for a walk in the Alps, you can see how many aeroplanes there are crisscrossing up there in the ether. You can see it beautifully, those exhaust fumes crystallizing and building a cloud. A beautiful picture, but it's not, of course, beautiful. It's harmful. 20% of environmental damage simply because of the air traffic over the European Alps. You can just imagine how much that is across the globe as a whole. And then there's a whole other area which has been generated by mass tourism, but not only mass tourism. As a result of the financial scandals we've been going through since 2007, the big crisis and all the other little crises that followed it. The construction boom in Spain has completely dried up. In Spain, from about 2001-2002, huge amounts were invested in new buildings all along the coast, most of them along the coast, and many of those structures that were begun at the time now stand there, ruins, because the property developers and the prospects of earning money with those buildings have disappeared. And they are a blot on the landscape too, who knows how long they will survive there. So we've just got these indications here and there. Mass tourism combined with other problems like the financial crisis have led to a whole tangled web of problems. And so we have to take that criticism of mass tourism seriously. Of course, if the Spanish property developers hadn't borrowed so much money to build those concrete blocks without really understanding whether they would ever be profitable, that would be another question, but the flying will continue. And people will be happy to pick up those cheap fares wherever they can. Now, I don't just want to be gloomy and decry mass tourism, that wouldn't be fair, because travelling is a wonderful thing. 
nur darauf aus, and not all airlines are only about maximizing profit. Many of them have been aware of the environment for many years. For example, just one example, over 20 years ago, Lufthansa placed an ad in the newspaper, ran an advertising campaign, a one-page black and white ad I remember one, it was in all the national newspapers, and it said, we don't fly everywhere. We don't fly everywhere. What were they trying to tell us? Well, on this huge poster, this one-page ad, you could see elephants and primeval forest in the background. And what Lufthansa was trying to tell us was, we don't fly to those places where nature has a right to be left in peace. That was the message, really. And I thought that was amazing 20 years ago. Now, one might hope that Lufthansa was still placing such bold ads, and of course they're not cheap, in national newspapers. If you look today to see what Lufthansa is doing, it's advertising with dream travel. Dream travel. Well, of course, we'd all like to go on a dream trip. Anyone who's been on one will be able to tell us that it wasn't quite a dream, but the advert is a dream. It's beautiful because the battle over passengers is amazing. There are airlines that are subsidized by national governments. I don't have to name any countries here. It doesn't happen for Lufthansa, of course. They have to fight really hard in order to withstand that huge pressure. So dream travel. What do dreams have to do with traveling? Well, of course, this is a question that people have been asking for thousands of years. And today, people know immediately what is meant by dream travel, for example, the Grand Canyon in Colorado. Why is that a dream destination? Because the natural resources you can experience there are a huge spectacle. You'll be told that the canyon is 450 kilometers long. 450 kilometers, that's about half as long as Germany from the south to the north. That's quite a long way, 450 kilometers. And all of it is the canyon. And this canyon breaks down into three big parts, the youngest of which is six or seven million years old, and the others 20, 30 million years. For us people, this is inconceivable. It's fantastic to witness this. It's quite spectacular. Immanuel Kant would have taken examples like this and called them sublime. Why sublime? Isn't it just beautiful? No, no, for Kant it was sublime. But sublime to him meant something else. It meant the feeling we get before things that are unbelievable, magnificent. You're standing in front of Niagara Falls and you see these tremendous volumes of water coming down there or a waterfall in South America. Then you have this experience of the sublime. You feel small. You feel like an ant faced with this amazing, huge nature, Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls or... I don't know, maybe a trip to the Antarctic. I just mentioned that this question about why dreams are associated with travel and have been for so long, well, if we look back in the history of humanity, we will find a number of chronicles, documents, where travel is described as a dream or as a myth. Everyone's familiar with the Od Odyssey, the travels of that great warrior from Troy towards Ithaca, where he left his home. It was a journey that lasted many years because he kept going the wrong way. They didn't have instruments in those days to get their bearings. They didn't have satellite positioning and all that. Odysseus did undertake a dreamlike trip, but actually a dangerous one. It was an adventure. An adventurous dream, beautifully described in the Odyssey, especially when we talk about these 
very distinguished meetings between this good-looking warrior Odysseus and those amazing female creatures he met, the nymph Calypso, for example. Now, who wouldn't like to meet the nymph Calypso? Or Nausicaa, the king's daughter, Princess Nausicaa, who found him lying there on the shore, or Circes, or Polyphemus, that one-eyed monster that wanted to kill him, or the danger of the sirens. The sirens is perhaps the best example of this combination of dream and danger. Those sirens with their wonderful singing, which everyone fell prey to because they were so enchanted by the singing that they wanted to follow the sound and then they drowned in the process. The sirens. Odysseus had himself strapped to the mast so that he could listen, but the helmsman had to have his ears stopped with wax so that he didn't fall into temptation. Or another one, Marco Polo. That was a dream trip. Apparently he met the emperor of China. And he came home with all sorts of stories. It's not entirely clear today how much of these stories were actually based on authentic events. But Marco Polo was the great medieval figure who, even in our modern times, symbolized this dream travel. And Venice, it was a nation, a state at the time. It was the state that had a particular interest in long trips in travel, because as a state it was very tiny, and it survived off the exchange with other cultures. A good example of this exchange, actually, because Venice was very respectful of the other cultures that it traded with, and we'll come back to that topic in a minute. That's why Venice was successful for so long. Respect went hand in hand, of course, with military resources, but nevertheless, respect for the other cultures, otherwise trade would not have flourished. In more recent history, in more recent European history, traveling, especially from the 17th century onwards, has become a tremendous theme. I can't go into detail about why, but one key word here is Arcadia. You'll probably say, well, what on earth is Arcadia? Well, it's a landscape, a landscape in the center of the Peloponnesus in Greece. I can recommend anyone to visit. And Arcadia was the dream of a world where people would most like to live with shepherds and sheep. But why would German or European artists and philosophers and poets be interested in Arcadia? They don't want to be shepherds and they certainly don't want to be sheep. And the life of shepherds and sheep is probably not the life they want to lead either. So what was going on there? What was going on was an untainted lifestyle in an untainted ja, landscape, like paradise, the Garden of Eden, yes, life in paradise, that was the idea behind it, Arcadia, paradise, that fascinated people. And this landscape in Peloponnesus, there was a, an interesting aspect to that, because in the 17th century, at the latest, German philosophers and artists and writers became passionate about ancient Greece. Just as the Renaissance, Renaissance had looked back at the ancient world, in the neoclassical era, there was a Renaissance of things Greek an idea that there was a golden age of culture. There was a whole generation, several generations, in fact, of painters, writers, who went in quest of Arcadia, travelled across the Alps and ended up in Italy. In Italy, which at the time was, of course, quite different from what we know today. Let's just take a few examples. There was... 
A man born in the Tyrol, Franz Josef Koch, who lived from 1768 to 1739, came from a village, went off to Rome, was a well-trained painter. I don't have to mention all the training he went through. But he arrived in Rome and he wasn't terribly successful. He did sell paintings and lived off that. But of course, like all the others, like Peter von Cornelius and Friedrich Overbeck and other Nazarenes, there were a whole group of painters, was in quest of Arcadia. And from Rome, he roamed eastwards into the mountains, a world which still looks pretty much as it did then. We can do that by comparing the paintings with the reality today, because fortunately mass tourism hasn't reached this spot. He married an Italian, and he settled with her in Olevano Romano. Olevano Romano, a beautiful little town in the mountains, which still looks pretty much as it did then. There are two art centers, which are run by German institutions in that place. So the tradition hasn't been entirely forgotten. Olevano Romano, in the middle of a world, of shepherds and sheep, little villages, people with nothing. But the little or the nothing that they did have, they were happy to share with passing travellers. They were kind to strangers, they were hospitable. And this Friedrich Anton Koch, this Tyrolean, has descendants who still live quite close to Olivano Romano. So we can see this idea of a quest for paradise was implemented really by those artists who went on their travels. They achieved their dream. And this Josef Anton Koch, who painted a lot because he wanted to live off his paintings, and he brought Olivano Romano to Rome. Now you can do it in a car in two hours, but you can imagine how long he needed in those days. One of the great names in search of Arcadia was Friedrich Hölderlin, of course, the German poet. What is it? That chains me to these sacred coasts that makes me love them more than my own fatherland. What is it? Just four lines from a poem by Hölderlin. What is it? What chains me to this landscape? Why do I love this world, these coasts, more than my own country. Tübingen, Swabia are pretty too, but apparently it's this other landscape is even more appealing. Of course, he didn't go there. He didn't go to Italy like Koch did. He went to France. He was a tutor in Bordeaux. And he walked there, in fact. But this bundle of emotions, this explosive expression through poetry, this desire for Arcadia, we come across this in many of Hölderlin's poems. Of course, his dream destination is Greece. But for many people, Italy and Greece were the same thing. Now you'll probably say, OK, lovely story. But what does it mean today? What does it mean to us? We can read Hölderlin, of course. We can take his poems on a journey and read them out to anyone who wants to hear them. But a lot of people prefer to read a detective story when they're traveling. So what is travel today all about? I've already talked about mass tourism, and when you talk about that, then, of course, you almost always talk about things like sex tourism as well, and all other forms of exploitation, not only sexual, that are associated with it. You exploit a world when you flood into it as a crowd. It's no different here. In Germany, 
We are living in one of the most heavily populated areas in the world with all the problems. But what does travel mean today? For a lot of people, traveling is the same as being on holiday. Okay. Can't criticize that, although it's wrong actually because travel isn't holiday making. Holidays mean something else. It means recuperation, recreation. Traveling is hard work. Why? Because you see new things. You meet new people and new cultures, and that is hard work. Why? And you need to know things if you're going to be able to process all these things you're seeing. If you think you're traveling to take a holiday, then you already have a pretty distorted destination. That shouldn't stop anybody, of course, going anyone they feel they can to take their holiday. But that is not travel. The travel consists only in the trip from A to B to get to the holiday destination. But that's not traveling, that's flying or moving, but it's mobility. But it's not traveling. Traveling is something else. In fact, one might go so far as to say traveling needs to be prepared, it needs to be organized. You need to think when you're traveling. And of course, that is harder work. For a lot of people, holidays, and you can't blame them for this, it's just a continuation of their normal daily life with different resources, perhaps rather more time, rather more money, whatever. And without being controlled by their neighbors, watched by their colleagues, it can be free and easy. You can let your hair down. A lot of people think that going on holiday and painting the town red is the same thing. Well, okay, if they think that, who am I to argue? But that's got absolutely nothing to do with traveling. It's the same as drinking. No. I think that really belongs in the same pigeonhole as terrorism. Why terrorism? Because people who do this kind of holiday making terrorize the world wherever they arrive, whether it's Kenya or Majorca. It's got absolutely nothing to do with travel. Traveling has a certain framework to it that may be normative, it may even be ethical. And you're going to say, oh, in what way? Well, respect for the other, for example. I mentioned that when I was talking about Venice, which was so respectful of other cultural areas. Well, of course, they had their own laws and impose their laws on others to ensure that any contact was based on their rules. But they didn't destroy anything. They respected other structures. Mass tourism doesn't respect structures. So let's come back to those examples we find in history of respect for the other. As the Venetians showed, you can do good business on that basis. No problem. Respect for the other. That doesn't only apply for travel, it applies to here. Respect for the other. More and more we find ourselves debating here at home about how to be more respectful towards other types of people. We're quite happy to go to places where they spice the food differently with spices that you can still smell two days later, even from the mouths of those who eat it? But live like the people who cook like that? No, 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 no. And that's not fair, that's not okay. A lot of people come back from a long way off where they've been on holiday and they've brought all kinds of souvenirs with them. But the people they bought their souvenirs from, they wouldn't like as neighbors. And that is not okay. That is not fair. The way we relate to the other, there where the other is at home and in our own home, in both places, we have to apply the rules of fairness and we have to learn that. We're not born with it. Xenophobia, we may be born with. Animals, humans, are born with a xenophobic attitude. 
But we learn that people, other people, may think differently, pray differently, live differently, sing differently, but that's no reason not to respect them. Travel under these conditions that we respect others, that functions, that works. That is not terrorism for those who are being visited. And that is an essential prerequisite. Another prerequisite is you need a certain amount of education to travel. It sounds elitist, what I'm saying, but I don't mean it that way. If you have a feeling yourself that you are not educated enough to go to Turkey or North Africa, then there's plenty of literature out there. And there are people who will help you. Guides, companies, who can compensate you for what you don't know. Experts, specialists, who will lead you, guide you, show you around in an appropriate manner. And that, too, is hard work. You have to let yourself go with the flow. Sometimes you're so tired from all this input of information. And, of course, you don't always deal easily with the local diet. But my message, what I would like to appeal for, if we're going to think about the ethical aspect of travel, is you need to have some kind of prior understanding or positive prejudice, if you like, about the place you're going to, about the culture that you want to get to know better. And that positive prejudice should always be combined with respect for the other. And this has a positive impact on the way we live back at home, because then we don't have to worry about exercising our relationship with others, about learning how to deal fairly with the other at home, to our mutual benefit. So real travel, good travel, is essential.